students. Welcome to week eight. I know I had some um, sound issues last week, so can it, can you just give me a smiley face or something in the chat room as long as you can hear me? All right, thank you, Claire. Awesome, great. Thank you guys so much last week for your responses, your thoughtful responses on the uh, survey for the class. I love to do this mid-semester check-in so that I can kind of make sure that we're all on the same page and get some feedback so that I can adjust as we go on for the second half of semester. So I really appreciate your candor. Um, and I want to address a couple things, which I'll get to after the announcements. But one, I want to just go over our syllabus one more time to make sure everyone is completely on the same page and give you guys a very open opportunity to ask any questions you may have. Since we're not in person, I know it's a lot harder to have that dialogue back and forth. So I want to make sure that we're all very, very clear and there's no concerns there. Um, my, my intent with teaching this class, and you know, we, I know we went over learning objectives in the first couple of weeks, but I'm trying to create and instill a, a very knowledgeable uh, setting for you guys so you can understand what goes on in the industry, but also to kind of get used to what is expected of you as a member of the fashion industry. So one of the main purposes in the class, and I, I hope you would all agree, is that I'm not an extremely tough grader and the assignments are not extremely um, requiring a lot of outside information other than your own opinion. But a lot of what it is is just making sure you're following directions and reading things clearly and getting things in on time, just the way that a normal boss would expect that of you in the work environment. Um, so keep that in mind as you go forward with the rest of your assignments, and hopefully that's clear and not um, something that's of concern. But again, I'm always here if you want to chat about it too. A couple quick announcements. Um, as you know, lecture prep questions are blank, due before class, and then answering one question after class. Keeping it on the same email chain for easy grading. Um, at the end of class, there will be an attendance question. Um, email it to me for full credit for attending today. And um, the one to one career advice is still ongoing. If you still want a time slot, feel free to sign on and sign up. So, just as a syllabus refresher and a reminder, you can view the syllabus on Blackboard by clicking on content on the left nav, which I'm circling now, and then it is the first item on the page. Um, also, I'm just actually gonna share my screen with you guys very quickly. You can see Blackboard in general, and we can just go over what I have there. Um, let's see what happens if I... Okay. So um, if you go under content, as I mentioned, we have the syllabus. First and foremost, um, fashion critiques are done, but the lecture prep questions, this is the template that the lecture prep question should be sent on. The next assignment we have due is the State of Fashion 2020. Um, it's the current issues midterm. It will be due the week of Thanksgiving, Monday of Thanksgiving. But you can start reading this now. And the week before, I will publish the midterm. But if you start reading the state of fashion now, you'll be very well prepared and be able to answer the questions easily. Um, I am aware that the state of fashion, to the, which is comes out annually, has had a refresh given that 2020 is a very weird year and we now have um, you know, a lot of changes on COVID. However, the midterm is based on the original version and I want to hear from you guys on how you think the state of things have changed. So that's part of it. If you have read the State of Fashion 2020 with the COVID editions or you want to read that, you're welcome to and to comment on it. But the midterm is actually based off of the original one that was done back in um, November. The final exam will be posted here for you guys starting on December 15th. There is a Blackboard Collaborate tutorial for anyone who still has outstanding questions there. You can go through this. It will be very clear to you. And if you're ever missing the links to our class, um, you can click on Blackboard Collaborate Ultra link here to get through. The best fashion documentaries is still out there. I know a lot of you use this to do your fashion critiques, but feel free to peruse and see if there's anything else that's interesting. Just checking back because I see that there was a chat here. Um, huh. I want to make sure I'm answering. Or did someone raise a hand? No. Okay. 
All right, I'm going to go back to sharing them. Um, Professor, I do have one question for the sure. midterm. Can we start that whenever, or is it? No, um, no, it will be posted the week before. So the week before, I'll let you guys know when it's live. So what is the current issues midterm? The current issues midterm will be due on November 23rd, the Monday, is that the 23rd? Monday of Thanksgiving. And um, you'll have five days to complete it. So that's not, wait, sorry, I'm, I'm confused. I think that's not the midterm or that is the, mid, that's the test? It, it is the midterm, yeah, the test. But okay. the state of, the, the reading that it's based on is the state of fashion in 2020. Okay, so, but it's already up there now. It says current issues midterm, but we shouldn't start it until. I don't think you're able to access it on your side. Oh, it yes. says begin. Okay, all right. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, okay, sorry, I'll go back to sharing my screen. There we go. Okay, so, um, <laughs> and then every week I am posting these PowerPoints that I do, as well as the interview um, in video form. So you can come back here if you want to access anything at any point in time. Anyone else have any questions on that? I'm just going to quickly open the syllabus for you as well. Um, so you can access this at any time, but it does go through what our learning outcomes are to learn firsthand knowledge about current issues and events related to the fashion industry, to get an overview of diverse job opportunities ex existing in the fashion industry and along with tools and advice to prepare yourselves, and also to assimilate and express your opinion on fashion-related issues through analytical thinking, questioning, and reasoning. Um, the course requirements are all outlined here in a little bit more detail, but as far as percentages, you can see, as a reminder, attendance is a very, very important part of this class, 50% of your grade. Um, the current issue midterm will be 10% of your grade, two fashion critiques, which you've already done, were 15% all, all in, both of them together for your grade. And then the two lecture prep questions are 10%. With participation and your attendance answers rounding out five, and the final exam at 10%. Anyone have any further questions on this? I just want to make sure that you have proper amount of time to go through it. Okay. All right. Well, great. Well, we'll jump back into the regularly scheduled program. Um, just some guidelines on remote. As you guys have been doing, please raise your hand if you want to speak, and I'll call on you in order. If you have an immediate or pressing question, put it in the chat function. Chat function. Um, if you're speaking, please turn your camera on and um, try to turn your camera on preemptively if you have your hand raised, and unmute only when you begin to speak. All classes are being recorded. Quick flash of our schedule as we are getting down to our last few speakers, which is crazy. But we have Madeline Grayson and September Voda here today, which I'm so excited about. They're the co-founders of Tuckanuck. Uh, next week, we have Sarah Tosetti, who is a costume designer um, based here in New York. She's worked in Paris as well as Chicago. And the following week, we have Dan Dunaway, CEO, co-founder of Tomboy X. As I just mentioned, on November 23rd, we will not have class, but your current issues midterm will be due that day. You'll have five days to complete it before then. Um, on 11.30, Virginie Lanoue, uh, who's a coordinator for Isabel Morant, will be joining us. A very old school uh, house. It's uh, very interesting to hear that side of things from a uh, Parisian's experience. Um, and the following week, Kim Nemzer, who's the chief merchandising officer at Warby Parker. And I always like to end the semester with a panel from the Fashion Services Network, which is a group of individuals who support the fashion industry, whether it be from um, advertising, human resources, uh, recruiting, um, or financial standpoint. Anyone have questions on the schedule? Okay, great. Well, with that, I would love to introduce you guys to the co-founders of Tuckernock. Sorry. So um, Madeline Grayson and S September Voda are joining us today. 
Sorry, bear with me one second while I open up their bio. Carrie? Yeah. Hey, it's Maddie. Um, I just turned, is it, should we just keep our videos on and then just mute and unmute when we speak or? Yeah, that would be great. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's what I mean. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> so Tucker up, um, just as a back, some backstory on the company. So in 2012, um, they, they were moving into their first homes, attending weddings, traveling, having kids, and growing generally frustrated with the lack of retailers that reflected their classic but modern lifestyle. They would hunt for unique home brands, gifts, and clothes in small boutiques, but yearned for an online equivalent that made shopping easy. They became fixated on creating happy and authentic retail brand that embodied their classic style and spirit rooted in sport, travel, family, friends, and celebration. So they quit their day jobs in finance and retail and launched Tucker Nut together. And in 2008, they also expanded into their own clothing and accessories line. So with us today is Madeline um, War Grayson, who uh, was always inspired by fashion and architectural design growing up in a family of real estate developers and architects. With two entrepreneurial parents, she too dreamed of pursuing her ideas in curating and marketing, discovered designers in an aspirational but attainable way. Maddie met September in college and connected as best friends, travel companions, and avid study buddies during junior year abroad in London. They shared an appreciation for design and the arts through their time abroad and in New York City. Once graduated and in the recession of 2009, Maddie moved back to Washington to work for a growing accessory and storage business called Scout, only to be enamored by the world of retail. She learned from the co-founders who are husband and wife, a successful entrepreneur and trend forecaster stylist from Vogue, what it takes to start a successful retail brand. Maddie oversaw their wholesale division of 2,500 retailers. And 2011, she and September quit their jobs and launched Tucker Nook. Maddie oversees the content division and still is on the buying and design committee. All of Tucker Nook's content is original. She works closely with Sophie, the creative director, and also a close friend and classmate from the University of Pennsylvania to create and distribute the content that evokes the Tucker Nook brand. I also want to introduce you guys to September uh, Voda, who was raised in a retail family and watched her dad create a successful chain of grocery stores throughout her life. This gave her the entrepreneurial dream to one day start her own business. She began her career uh, working for Alberto Ferretti in New York and on to free people in the planning division. Soon after, she joined Maddie in D.C. to work for a smaller brand called Scout Brands, where together they learned the ins and outs of a growing accessory brand. September launched their direct-to-consumer business, and a few days later, they left to start, a few years later, sorry, they left to start Tucker Knock with Maddie's sister, Jocelyn. Beginning as buyers, they built the business to curate products from 250-plus independent brands encompassing ladies and men's apparel, along with home decor, totes, and totes. Tatskis, sorry. Um, September now focuses on the private label business of Tucker Duck, which is 50% of their business. Working with contracted designers and also acting as the lead designer with Jocelyn, as well as the main point of contact with the manufacturer. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful ladies of Tucker Duck. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for being here, guys. We're so happy Thanks you're here. Um, and are you guys both in D.C. right now? Or? Yes, we're both in D.C. We are not at our office, though. So, um, we are expanding into the space next to us as well. So we, oh, it was not a great day for us to be in the office. But so, yeah, we're, we're both here <laughs> but in separate places. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you both for joining us. Um, so... Obviously, I just gave a lot of backstory, and you guys are great friends for a while and had this idea to launch the company. Can you, can you tell us about the birth of Tucker Nook and how it kind of all came about? Um, yeah, I can speak to that. So I think um, just kind of going off of what you said, um, September and I, we've always kind of shared a passion. Also, I apologize. There's a bird next to me. Um, so if it, it starts <laughs> chirping loudly, I'm really sorry. Um, but yeah, we we both have always kind of had a passion for finding unique things and then storytelling. And so when we we 
both grew up in entrepreneurial families and sort of got had this idea to aggregate and these brands and create this kind of boutique shopping experience online um, and really give exposure to a lot of up and coming brands, but also, you know, our dream was to carry the, the famous brands as well, kind of for us, um, the more heritage brands like a barber or St. James, if you've heard of those. Um, and so we worked really hard to launch the business on Shopify. Um, we actually had some funding out of, we went, we did a little fundraise in the beginning. Um, we were part of an incubation program out in Mountain View, California, um, which was called 500 Startups. I don't know if you've heard of Y Combinator, one of those, but it really forced us to kind of have this startup boot camp where you had to put your business plan together and, you know, we quickly had revenue and without a lot of capital, um, we're able to launch Tucker Nuck on Shopify and really had drop ship vendors that we had convinced um, to be on our platform. So fast forward to now, you know, our book of, we probably have at, worked with over a thousand brands, I'd say by now, and usually wow. at any point have active, you know, 250 plus unique retail brands that we're selling. Um, and it has been, when we first started, it was a lot more men's clothing. And um, now our women's business has just taken off in the last, you know, three years. And then in 2018, we launched our own product line. Um, and September, we'll speak more to that later. But the whole business is just, our. we've always created our own content, our own photography. Um, we I'm on the content side, so we've probably shot like, 100 catalogs to date now um, and that was always important to us is kind of sh our brand coming through in the imagery um, and not just selling the products but also what the Tucker Nuck brand was was kind of how we were selling it to you and so we really value thinking whenever we go to buy we're we're also thinking very practically okay where am I wearing this when is this arriving? What type of events are you going to? Um, and just always really kind of thinking through that and not just having a lot of pretty items on the website. So we're very data driven, analytical, but um, I think we've we've learned a lot in the last, I guess, seven or eight years. Um, and but it's always been um, a big part of our brand has just been our company mission, which is this happy retail brand um, that doesn't take itself too seriously, uh, but really does value, you know, getting dressed and looking nice every day and the events and where you're going. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. That's great. Well, yeah, I first heard about you actually from friends and then found out recently when, when you guys uh, got connected with me that you actually went to college. I went and you were my sorority so <laughs> it's kind of uh interesting that I heard about you the other direction so that's a good tribute yeah. to how big you guys have gotten <laughs> yeah but I would say like our whole sort of the way we started our business and have always been is this kind of entrepreneurial mindset of um being really scrappy and sort of putting this business together and evolving as we go and not necessarily having this really impressive resume of, you know, being, it's not super textbook, but I think we learn quickly and we're very detail oriented. And so we've been able to build a successful business. Yeah, that's great. Um, September, did you have anything you wanted to add? About that? Okay. Yeah, I think there's to Matt's point that we, Parents are very entrepreneurial and kind of always encouraged us to create our own destinies. So it was very unique to find someone else like that in school. So Patty and I quickly bonded over that. I mean, we just always knew we were going to do something together. We didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but we knew we wanted to build a business that could make all of our dreams come true. Really allow us to explore all of the sides that we had kind of been um, so interested in over the years. That's great. Um, just goes to show that you never know who you're sitting next to and how far your relationship will go <laughs> when you're sitting in college. Yeah. <laughs> when you are, um, you are married to them. 
<laughs> and just be sure that it's the only one we've found. Totally. Um, so what did you guys, you both had different paths before you got here. Um, September, I don't know if you want to start with what you were doing before you decided to launch Chuck or Neck. Really grown up. Didn't we? So, Tim, are she I cutting out the business? Of the business. Um, she oh, is for me, but I wasn't sure if it was my fault. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's cutting in and out a little bit, September. That's. Uh, oh no, should I log out? Or, yeah, maybe. Do you? I don't know if you have anything else on your Wi-Fi, like your phone or anything. That sometimes, if I turn that off, it helps a little. Um, a little better. Am I still cutting? It's a weird yeah. thing. I've never heard it. it. That's so annoying. Let me turn off my Bluetooth. So now it sounds good. Uh, that seems better. Yeah. Okay. Is it now? I think so. <laughs> um, just understanding retail from the grocery business, but I mean, all retail businesses built the same in terms of wholesale retail margins, that type of thing. And then um, worked on the sales side at Alberta Forever. Um, on the planning side at Free People, and these were just internships throughout college. And then Maddie and I both got the year after we graduated. And then, I mean, we launched our first company together, close to that. So it was about a year after college that we launched our first company together. So we didn't really have much experience to talk about. Experience <laughs> has been we call the Tucker Knock MBA program because that's really been what's taught us over the years how to do everything. You, Google is an incredible resource and we just become very resourceful in terms of reaching out to our network and learning things along the way. Trial by fire, yeah. <laughs> as they say. That's great. Um, how, how, how are you guys, do you divide up the business? And I know you have a third partner also. So um, how are you three kind of split up? So um, how we split it up pretty much is very tied to the, the product. So we're all involved in the buying and um, design initiatives. And then I focus on the operations, logistics, digital marketing side of the business. Maddie really focuses on all of our content and organic marketing. Um, Jocelyn focuses on all the design and the product in addition to any major strategic initiative. So each year have you know one major goal building out stores or launching new product lines or whatever the major initiative might be for that year. She really takes the lead on that. That's great. Cool. And how and how big is your company at this point? How many people do you have? So now 30 full time thirty full time employees. Uh, but then wow. we work with so many contractors that are basically on the team. Yeah. It's probably like 30 people with between like the designers and then you think about E and all the different contacts that we work with. Yeah, that's great. So you guys kind of have um, three different arms, I guess, sort of. You have wholesale that like you bring in and you buy from different people and then you have your own private label. And then you also have like running your direct consumer website. So, I mean, I don't know if you necessarily describe yourself as a split that way, but I, just in looking at your business model, um, how how big is wholesale versus private label? Is it percentage wise? Like is your wholesale sale a very big part of your business? Buying wholesale. So now we, wholesale typically, it used to be that we we're buying 100% and now it's down to 50%. So we're buying 50% oh. Party retail vendors, and then 50% is our own product line. And that, I mean, that jumped pretty Impressive. quick. It was a tremendous success we saw in the product that we just kept investing more in it. So now it's 50% of our product line and 60% of our sales. 
Wow, that's really amazing. Yeah, and it, and it's, it's 2018. Jewelry, it was impressive. Apparel and jewelry. Um, I mean, mainly apparel, but it's but we do make our own accessories also. Very cool. Um, and students, just as a reminder, I know we talked about private label a couple weeks back, but that's when, um, you know, in the product life cycle, if you take something from A to Z, uh, if you make it and create it and design it and then actually go through and actually sell it out to your customer, customer that would be taking things the whole way vertical. Um, is one way that some people call it, like an Ann Taylor would be like completely vertical like that, private label. So it actually has the Tucker Nuck label on it, their product. They're the only ones who are selling it. They're the only ones who own it. Um, versus the buying from, say, you mentioned Barber before, but um, I don't know if you still work with them, but uh, buying from a different brand where you actually pick up the product at you know, point M halfway through the life cycle of the product and take it through to Z, selling it to the customer. So. Hopefully that's clear, but if you have questions. And, and then you know, a little bit of background on how we even got into private label. Um, it's definitely not something we jumped into overnight. We kind of walked before we ran. So we obviously been able, we have been at a strategic advantage being able to sell all of these third and really test the demand across products and categories. What sold well versus what didn't, what made sell well. It was it the print? Was it the color? Season? As we gather all of this data, we first started out by just designing exclusives with these third parties. So we would say, okay, dress, but we wish it, would, you know, we'll but we'll commit to a hundred units of this if we could sell it exclusively. Beyond exclusives, we started developing a little bit of white. Okay, we want to do this, but we want to put our. And then eventually, we got to. We're like, okay, a lot of these brands can't keep up with how much product we have to create on our. Own. And really did privately on our own, but we definitely have always, and we continue to dabble with exclusives, working with some um, third parties. We. We know that they do the best. We're just looking for a certain twist on it um, to be able to offer to our customer. Is the sound continuing to be bad for others? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is a good idea. Call in or something? If it or what is? Oh, I call it it cuts in and out. It's bizarre, and then it catches up, and but then your video is not blurry, so it's kind of strange. Yeah. Here, I'll use my hand. I've had some weeks where I have problems too, so I, I don't know. It's there's no rhyme or reason. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that if, can you hear me? Okay, or is it? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay, so I think the main, yeah, the main thing is just that we had a lot of years of selling other brands, products from other brands, and it gave us just a lot of understanding of where there was white space and then to design into and things that we couldn't find at the right price point and then also just so much data on what sells well and um so it wasn't like we were starting with you know with nothing we were definitely designing yeah. with a purpose that's a really smart way to build your business yeah. I'd say and probably why it's grown so fast for you yeah maybe and then as we heard about exclusives I think like it's been wonderful to be able to work with a lot of the brands that we sell that we don't have access to block printing in India, for example. And there's a brand called Banjan and that's, it has, you know, all the, everything is made in India, these amazing block printers. And so then we're able to work with her to create an exclusive Tucker Nock Banjan and dress and sell a lot of units and have a good margin. And so that's kind of a win-win. So we definitely enjoy doing those collaborations because we can't do that ourselves um, and our customer appreciates it too. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I had a question for you also, I, I believe if I read your timeline right, that you guys all started a family since you have launched your business and just wondering how that, you know, if that's been a challenge for you or any advice you may have on that front. <laughs> Yep. September and I actually had our first child 10 weeks apart. We found out we were. Oh, wow. And then I think Jocelyn had 
four kids in the last eight or nine years. <laughs> so we've all supported each other um, through starting families. And I think the main thing is just being able to lean on each other um, and navigate the new this new phase of life. Um, and it's definitely been a little bit, it's definitely exhausting at some points, but I think you just learn to, um, you know, have help and lean on your family when you can and uh, each other when it, things feel a little bit unbearable <laughs> or impossible. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the big thing for us that we all, that we realized, I think we were probably working you know, 16 hours a day before we had kids. And then it just forces you to prioritize and delegate more. So you just become more efficient in a lot of ways. Um, but still, it feels like there aren't enough hours in the day ever. <laughs> so, so true. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, when you guys initially launched, how did you go about customer acquisition and getting your name out there so that you could find your like-minded customers? It's, can you hear me now? I called in yes. from my phone. Is this better? Yeah, that is better. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, one of the major advantages of Techonox starting out with having all of these third-party brands is that we were able to leverage people Googling Barber as much as they were Techonox. So we could really take advantage of the brands that had recognition from customers. And then on top of that, We've sourced a lot of new customers from Facebook and Instagram, and we've, over the years, kind of, we call it the um, perfect storm of when we nail the imagery with the inventory behind the product. So we always say that your digital marketing is only as strong as the inventory behind it. So making sure that we're always marrying the, the perfect blend of having these amazing um images that people you know really inspire and people want to click on in addition to also having the inventory so that it's available to buy so it's something that we've really focused on over the years and i think we've um like maddie said worked really hard on always cre creating our own content from um did you know virtual catalogs to doing all of our own um studio imagery in-house. So we have a photography studio in our office in Washington, D.C. And, I mean, at this point, we are we have a model in there at least three times a week. So with the amount of products that we're turning out on the site, we're shooting, you know, 40 products a day um, on three models three times a week. And I think always having full control over our, our digital assets and really being the ones to – put the inventory behind it too has put us at a serious advantage in terms of being able to acquire customers successfully and profitably. Yeah. And, and looking on your website, you guys are a really big part of that and oftentimes are the model I've noticed. <laughs> so it was that a very conscious effort from the beginning or just kind of something that has come about? <laughs> that has become more of a thing since <laughs> The virus so came bad. about, and we had more <laughs> time there. And the there was that you know couple week period where we had, I mean, we had new products all the time, and we didn't have, we couldn't get photographers and models. Obviously, um, I mean, authenticity is a big part of our brand. So yes, we've always been Instagram. We were on right away when we launched the company, and everyone always, I think. A big part of our competitive advantage is that our customer relates to us and um so Jocelyn is our third partner she does she's good at being kind of the face of it but then September and I have gotten in some more of the pictures recently out of necessity but then also a lot of success um I think the sell through of the product was better when we were kind of authentically wearing it and people could relate I guess so um, that's great. Yeah. And I think yeah, I mean, it's even more important with the private label because it's one thing to model like other brands, but two, when you're designing product and you're really the customer for it too, I think like validating the product by wearing it and talking about it has really made the customers respond to it. So 
as much as we hate it, we realize that that's also what people crave and they want to feel a personal connection to the brand and the product and understand why you made it and, you know, where you're wearing it and how you're wearing it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, everyone's looking to make shopping more enjoyable. And in these days of being stuck at home in particular, it makes it feel like you're shopping with friends if you can really sense the authenticity of the product, just, exactly. which is great. Um, but actually speaking, speaking about COVID, tell us a little bit about what this year has been like for you guys and, you know, any adjustments that you've had to make. Sure. So, um, we've talked about how overcoming or like navigating the pandemic is probably one of our biggest victories to date. Um, as you can ima imagine, a lot of retail companies came off of last having their best year ever in 2019 which then turns into buying more inventory than ever for 2020. We were about to open up a massive store on Nantucket. So we had a lot of big plans and we were forced to cancel all of those plans immediately because we just were in a position where we didn't want to have huge risk factors. Um, the, the biggest being inventory. So we had to cut back a lot of our inventory. We had to, um, talk to all of these vendors that we had built incredible relationships with and convince them that although we can't take the buy now, we'll take it at some point. And um, they just have to work with us as um, they too were trying to navigate the situation. So it just really put our relationships to test. And I think um, we were able to come out of it better and stronger than ever. So I think it forced us to scale back on a lot of things that we probably didn't, that weren't necessities that you don't really realize until you're forced to kind of really discover what is completely necessary versus what is, you know, great to have. So um, now I feel like the business is in a better place than it ever has been, but it was a tough, a very, very tough six months. Yeah. Of just yeah. every single day kind of questioning everything you're doing and um, just weighing all the risk factors of every single um, channel of the business. Yeah, I can imagine. I think it's been very eye-opening for a lot of people, but it's great that you feel like you came out of it in a better way. Just good. Definitely. <laughs> poised, poised and ready for holiday, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, what do you feel like is the hardest part about running your own company? Maddie and I always joke about this, but it, it is like having another child and you just never stop worrying it, about it and you never can take your mind off of it. So I think um, just never being able to fully detach is probably the hardest part. Um, it's also what makes it amazing, but um, it truly is just a part of you. <laughs> and yeah. if you wake up thinking about it, you go to sleep thinking about it, you think about it all day long. So. <laughs> Um, that can be a little emotionally draining at times. Yeah, yeah. Anything to add that you wanted to add? And I'd say yeah, that's probably the biggest biggest challenge. How about how about the best part? There's so many. Uh, we we couldn't write enough down that we kept listing off the best parts because it really <laughs> is um, just. Being able to work with your best friends and make your dreams come true. I mean, there's nothing better than that. And having full control over your own destiny. Um, how per We always talk about how personal the success becomes because you have so much skin in the game. Everything, you're tied to everything. Every product, every content push, every email that goes out for marketing. Um, every piece of the business has your footprint on it in some way. So I think that makes it that much more rewarding when something goes well. And when it doesn't go well, you feel it too. But um, it's definitely just um, really motivating. And um, the longer we do it, the more we love it. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, when you guys decided that you were going to start about doing private label, none of you guys had a design background um, originally. So how did you get that going? Did you hire someone or were you able to work with outside resources or? So we work with a lot of um, designers that um, we work with on a contractual basis for across categories. But then I think um, we're, we were also 
at an advantage because we have eight years under our belt of selling product, knowing what sells, knowing what makes something sell. Um, I mean, we could rattle off things all day of what really works for our customer versus not. So it was when we um, started the private label, we already kind of knew what we wanted to create, what there was white, white space for, or what we felt like we could just do a lot better than what existed in the market. So um, it was definitely like eight years of understanding designs and what makes them sell that um, allowed us to jump into private label so easily. That's great. Um, so both of you guys started in New York City, I believe, right? <laughs> and and moved to, sorry, both of you guys started in New York City and moved to DC. Can you talk to us a little bit about the different personalities of the two cities as far as working? Yeah, um, so we, Obviously, most of our vendors and all the showrooms are all in New York. So we definitely, before, again, the coronavirus, um, we were there, I'd say, like, twice a month almost, meeting with oh, wow. vendors. And then um, we have our production houses there, so where all of the fittings happen and the fabrics um, and the samples are made as in New York. Um, so we were going up there a lot um, prior to this, but yes, we we ju we were just in New York for a couple summers, and then um, DC I think has made it so that we've been able to be kind of removed from trends and maybe like the higher fashion in New York. Jocelyn lives there, um, so we always feel like we have access to it, but we're able to kind of keep our heads down in Washington and. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of retail companies here, but there's a, there are a lot of entrepreneurs and successful businesses and actually access to capital. And um, so it, and we have a, a good, a very good network here. So I think it's been a good place from a business perspective to launch our company. Um, and I mean, who knows what it would have been like if we had started in New York, but I, I do think we're able we have customers. Our biggest market right now is Texas, and then um, New York is, I guess New York's our number one state, but then Texas and um, the Southeast is really taking off for us. So I think we're able to kind of keep, stay true to our brand and not be too influenced by um, being removed from like, the fashion scene, I guess. Yeah. The positive part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned before that you were going to have a pop up in Nantucket got put on hold. Have you had any pop-ups? Oh. Any other pop-ups so far? We have a store in Washington that we launched in, 20, we opened in 2016, and then we were going to open a store, yes, in, in Nantucket, um, and we've done a lot of pop-ups uh, and sort of trunk shows, um, and we were going to roll out more stores, but have put that on pause right now. Yeah. Understandably. <laughs> but I mean, um, we, we believe in brick and mortar um, being a, it's been, our business, is, our store has been very successful in DC, very successful. So that's great. Yeah. And you know, it used to be, and by used to be, I mean like in the 2000s that you would, you had to have your business going in stores before you would ever go online. And then it was a lot of different online only players. And now it's really the norm that you would launch online and get your business off the ground, understand your customer for, you know, you guys for five years before you would go and jump at first into holding a rent, <laughs> holding a rent mm -hmm. up or having to pay rent, I should say. Um, I also imagine from a business starting perspective that being out of DC is probably a little bit more reasonably priced to be finding office space and having you know, photo shoots and things like that. Yeah, more, which I'm sure, which I'm sure is a big plus too for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, who's the most interesting person you guys have met in your career so far? Anyone? Any cool stories? <laughs> I'll let you speak for number because oh, wow. so something we always talk about is that because we grew up with entrepreneurial parents, we say our parents continue to be the most interesting and the most inspiring because they're always pushing us to do more, to dream bigger and like do better and that nothing is impossible for us. 
as long as we keep putting our heads down and just never giving up. But um, I think we always go back to that our parents are always the ones p- pushing us the most and really believing in us and have been since day one and continue to really just be so interested in the business and interested in our success. So um, when answering that question, yeah, we always go back to um, our parents being the ones that have truly influenced us the most and have been the most interesting to us because they've overcome a lot of these challenges as well that we're facing head on. Yeah. Yeah. We have met, I mean, we've met a lot of really interesting people, though. I'd say, like, someone we really related to and um, looked up a lot was Marla Beck, who started um, Blue Mercury. I don't know if, if you know that. And then they were recently acquired by Macy's. But um, she was had a similar story to us. We read about her in this book called The Intelligent Entrepreneur. And then we actually ended up sharing an investor with her. Um, and then she lives in Washington, and so we've connected with her a few times. Um, she's definitely someone that we admire and have um, learned from uh, among a lot of other people. So um. so you, you've mentioned um, investors actually a couple times, and I know this is off of not off the questions that I gave you in a preparation, but how did you go about finding investors initially when you, you had this great idea and you need to drum up some support to get it off the ground. September. <laughs> you went September. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you can speak yeah. to, you can answer this one if you want about investors. Um, we went and came out of it a lot of different ways. So we started off just really reaching out to friends and family. And then we would go to a ton of tech um, meetups and um, investors, and we just honestly became very shameless in terms of just really becoming interested in other people, learning about what they did, and then they became interested in us, and um, we kept those relationships over the years, and um, a lot of those relationships turned into investors, but it really started out with friends and family, and then kind of grew from there, and fortunately, we've only had to do... Um, we've done a minimal amount of fundraising because we were able to become profitable rather quickly when, by keeping the business model really lean and um, scrappy. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, is there anything that you feel like you would have done differently in college to prepare yourself for this path? Did I just... Um, college, I think, I mean, I wish I maybe had had some more internships, probably. I really, I think having work yeah. experience is so valuable. Um, and I, I, agree. I grew up in a real estate family of real estate development and, um, real estate finance. And my dad was, had as an architecture degree. So I always appreciated design, but I had never been so and I worked for real estate developers always, but I feel like if I could have had some more internships in other industries that I would have enjoyed that in college. I should have had more jobs during college maybe. Um, what about you? Sophie? Yeah, I I I just think you can never have enough real life experience. So I think just continuing to explore internship opportunities or just even part-time jobs, whatever you can do to kind of learn different industries is so invaluable. And just meeting and connecting with as many people as possible because your college network is oftentimes your best network. Um, and you're able to meet and create so many relationships um, over the years because of it. So definitely take advantage of it while you're there and afterwards. Great advice, for sure. Um, and I guess on the business launching front, my last question for you before I turn it over to students would just be what advice you have for someone who's interested in getting their company off the ground? September 1st. You just think long, think wrong. You just got to do it. <laughs> we can only talk about it, write down your ideas for so long, and at some point, you just have to jump into the deep end. So um, I think as long as you commit to never giving up, that you'll always be successful because 
the only way to fail is if you give up. Yeah, I mean, I think going off of that, it's more also just embracing that you you got to evolve. I mean, we started with like, a honestly, our very first business was a college flash sale website. And so now we've evolved into this and we were able to launch our own private label now, which is taking off. So I think it's just understanding that how you start, if you're smart, you're adapting constantly and evolving. Um, and that is, I think, a big part of the being successful um, when you're launching a business. And you definitely just have to get used to failing because you will make mistakes. You will make them every day, all day long for a very, very long time. I mean, we still make mistakes every day, all day, but it's just how you jump back from them and how you grow from them that really makes the biggest difference. Yeah, growing thick skin and then always learning. And I think what Jocelyn does a good job of, because um, September and I, in the have, since the beginning, have been in the weeds of the business always, you know, building the book of business with the brands, calling and getting them to agree to let us sell them on our website. Before we even had any money to buy the product, we were convincing them to let us drop ship it, um, meaning that like we, we would sell it, send it to our customers once the customer bought it on the website. Um, and so I think it's just, yeah, continuing. To, Jocelyn was very good at kind of seeing the forest from the trees. So uh, kind of making sure you always step back too. Great. Um, awesome. Well, with that, I want to turn it over to the students, make sure I give them enough time to get all their questions in. Uh, do you guys want to raise your hands? Sharon, I see you first. Hi. Um, oh, great. Okay, I don't know what to click. I'm sorry, tech challenge. It's going to be tougher tougher for me than it was for you. Um, <laughs> I think that um, the professor should send this video, um, this recording, to your parents, because that was a very lovely tribute that every parent wants to hear. <laughs> Being a parent, I can, I, I think, that would be a really nice Thanksgiving present. Okay. Um, I was looking at your stuff. It's beautiful. I love it. I want to buy it. It's great. Um, sort of, I guess, from a novice perspective, how did you pick your target population? Because I'm looking at the price point and I'm looking at the pieces. And how did you cultivate? Um, your client um, more so more so you know pushing them towards your private label or not pushing but you know moving them gently um, as opposed to you know stuff that was not um, private label does that make sense yeah that's a great question. So I think um, we always go back to that we are the customer. So we're always designing things for ourselves. And um, typically, if we would buy it, then it does really well online. And I think our private label, we try to keep our sweet spot is under 300. So it helps us bring the price point across the website down a bit because we were finding that a lot of the brands that we were buying from the average price point was between 150 and 400. So all of our private label um, is under $300 for the most part. Um, and then we also have a, a lower price point line, Palm Ander Place, which we try to keep everything under $100. So um, naturally, the customers are always going to buy the most of, you know, whatever price point is the lowest. So we were at a strategic advantage that our price point um, for our private label comes in significantly lower than the third parties that we buy. All right, that's that's helpful. Thank you. As a layer up to that, did you guys ever work with an outside um, media company, social media company to kind of grow followership? Or is that is that something that exists? Our social marketing agency. Oh. Are you to, yeah. 
Oh, well, we work with a marketing agency to run all of our paid performance advertising. So anything um, across Facebook, um, Google, or Instagram that's truly paid advertising. But we've never worked with a third party to grow our Instagram or Facebook following organically. That's great. Impressive. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Anything else? All right, I have Angel next. Hi, how are you? Hello. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you first for talking. It was really nice to hear from two people because most of the times we've had a speaker on, it's been just like one. Um, it was nice hearing how you guys work together and everything. Um, so my question was about the aesthetic of your brand um, and kind of like the classic but modern style. I really love it too. Like I was looking at your pieces, I really like a lot of them. Um, and I was gonna ask where you guys pull inspiration from or if you had any like inspirations from your life or like films or media that you really um, inspire you or like the type of clothes for the brand. Yeah, sure. So we're always inspired by the past and definitely have a lot, a ton of vintage archives, whether it be fabrics or um, silhouettes. And then, um, Maddie, you can kind of speak to the other ways we develop inspiration for um, the product line. Our, uh, usually each collection kind of has an inspiration board that we start off with um, and we work closely with our creative director. Um, I think we try to make it embody all of our aesthetics a little bit. So I'd say I have a more kind of, I lean more towards the feminine pieces that are kind of, and then I'd say September has more of the kind of clean modern so you're kind of inspired more like by the 60s of it in some ways and different periods kind of speak to us. Um, and we're really excited about la launching our active wear brand and that is heavily inspired by like the 70s and 80s. And um, that's gonna be athletic stuff that we're really excited about coming next spring. Um, but I think we have a lot of nostalgia around, I'd say the 80s just cause that's when we we're growing up and um, but we're, we're inspired by lots of things. <laughs> That's cool. You could really see the um, like the the time periods and like a lot of different pieces. So I really, yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're definitely, I would say September two, just going off of that, we're very into all the interior design and appreciate all of the just fabrics and fabric designers. And um, a lot of our best selling things are print driven too. So we work hard to source and develop now with um, artists prints for the different collections. You said at first that your men's business was a, the bigger part of your business? What's your it was, split it, now? It was a it wasn't the bigger part. It was a a larger part than it is now. Now it's like ninety seven percent. Yeah. Ninety seven percent women. Yeah. Because you have decor as well and like gifts and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that is that part actually all does really well. It's all just goes back to how many buyers we have and how many accounts accounts mm -hmm. we can manage um, and just kind of working smart, not hard. Yeah. So it's just constantly a battle of, you know, how many Purvis Tumblr cups can you sell versus, you know, a shirt dress. Mm -hmm. You can sell a lot more shirt dress, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Who else has a question? I see one, Kim. Hi. Um, uh, thank you for today. And I have a question like, um, I want to start my own business in the future. So uh, I'm curious, like, it must be really difficult to attract a lot of customers when you first start your own business. So, but how long did it take for you to attract enough customers to stabilize your business? Sure. 
definitely takes a long time, <laughs> I think. But I always go back to if you have one customer, then you can have hundreds of thousands of customers. So all it takes is the first customer in the door that someone wants to buy that something that you're selling. And then you just take it day by day and um, grow it slowly and smartly. But I think it's a, it's a long road to build a retail brand. But I think um, now the – path to doing so can become so much easier because you can launch online and reach thousands and thousands of customers so quickly. But um, it's just you, I think we always believe that retail is the slow and steady game. So you definitely have to be patient and um, just really always be interacting with your customers and understanding what they want um, and providing the best customer experience along the way. But um yeah, Maddie, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think it takes it takes a while, but I, it goes back to also just having a great product and mm -hmm. a really a good a great product to sell and reliable customer experience. We've always really thought about the customer, and um, you know, we make returns easy. We ship really quickly. Um, in the beginning, we were in a not so good fulfillment center in North Carolina, and I think our repeat buying wasn't as strong because I they it wasn't as seamless of an experience. And now in the last like five years, we've been in this amazing third party uh, logistics in center in Maryland, and they are just top of the line um, and get things. They're just so well organized. It was a a group that scaled anthropology, so they're just the experience for the customer is really good, and and we just you know. We don't sell things we don't believe in, so I think that helps build your customer base. Is just having a good product, and and I think too now um, a lot of companies are starting out where you sell to the end consumer first, and then you break in, out into wholesale, which I think puts you at a major advantage because you really learn. You want to learn from the customer who ends up wearing and living in your product most of all, and. When you start out wholesale, you can kind of get influenced by buyers and what they want for their stores what, versus what the end customer wants. So I think, too, always thinking, okay, I want to sell to the end customer first and really understand who or he, who she or he is before I then venture into selling it to a middleman. Um, so I think even for us, like, we were always the ones going to the trunk shows in the beginning and um, – just really understanding who our customer was and not having anyone in between us and the customer. All right, to backtrack just a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about how you found your distribution centers? Because I feel like that's a complicated step in the process. <laughs> a lot of research. A lot of, a lot of, lot of like, Google, when you start your own company, yeah, Google everything. <laughs> so, but uh, this warehouse that we're in now, you definitely, again, lean a bit on your network. Is there a reference? Didn't we have references? Oh, because we are, we've worked with so many other vendors. Um, they, like, we found the first one through Castaway and Smathers and Branson, right? So they were, brands that we carried were in this fulfillment center uh, already, the first one. And then, again, they were the most affordable, but the quality of service for a reason <laughs> yeah it needed to be and then the next one i think was a, a little bit of a reference also and um just being on the east coast we needed to be on the east coast because most of our customers were up and down the east coast to be able to get their goods quickly um so it was in maryland it's in maryland now which is positioned well for us so and then just a lot of research and playing them against each other looking at pricing and but knowing where a lot of our vendors ship from that gave us a good starting point, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and how we've really found any company that we've ever worked with over the years is to, like, any company you admire and you think they have really good Facebook ads or you think their shipping is quick, you can Google their name plus, like, distribution center and pretty easily find out where it is. And that's honestly how we've found out a lot of the third parties that we've worked with over the years. Oh, wow, that's smart. Um, Sharon is actually ch uh, chatting, putting in the chat a different question about how you did your truck shows or where you did them. 
We've oh. done them not all over, pretty much. Because, I mean, I guess Houses, I... Yeah. Schools. There's so much so, to say about trunk shows. <laughs> um, um, okay, well, yeah. basically, there are a few different ways that we look at, I guess, trunk shows. We, we've been invited to... So we we've popped up in strategic stores um, that have a good following. So for example, we have a lot of we have a lot of customers in Dallas, and then we were invited to collaborate with an interior designer who was opening her shop called Amy Berry. And then we kind of popped up in, popped up in there, and had we try to make more out of these sort of pop up weekend events with um, where we're hosted in other people's stores. Um, or at more like fundraising events so that we can also then have a dinner the day before with influencers and really kind of penetrate that market and um, may, and, and sort of make a splash and then also research, because we, we really were focused on rolling out more stores, we were trying to research these markets. So Chicago and Dallas and uh, like, in Connecticut, there was Greenwich and uh, Boston. Um, so we were strategically popping up in, uh, in other people's stores. And then we also have been invited to be part of those kind of bazaars, like um, holiday bazaars for fundraisers for um, a hospital or something. And we would have these big booths. But again, it was, it was a lot of, we definitely had good sales, but it was more just being in touch with the customer and understanding the market and what they liked and love seeing us in person and all of that. So all of that learning experience. That's great. Cool. Um, Janice, I have you next. Hi, um, thank you for coming to speak with us today. Um, my question is, who do you consider your competitors and how do you stand out from them? So we always say that J. Crew is probably our biggest competitor, um, and we stand out from them by just continuing to have unique product um, in addition to all of the third parties that we sell. We always say that having both is what makes us so unique because the high sells the low, the low sells the high, and like these discovered brands are also what helps us sell, our, validates our private label, and vice versa. So. Um, always striking that balance. And then we also said that say that all of the department stores are major competitors because they sell a lot of the brands that we carry and, you know, the shop ops and revolves of the world. So um, in much from, any time I thought like, was being spent elsewhere is a competitor of ours. Um, so we're just trying to capture as much in one shopping cart as we can. Um, and that's by launching new categories and, having enough of an assortment in all those categories so that we can one day become a one-stop shop. Uh, anything else, Janice, no? Uh, are there any other questions out there? Well, thank you guys so much for being here today, and good luck as you uh, turn the corner to Q4 and the crazy holiday season we're about to have. <laughs> That's with us so a lot of for us. <laughs> Shaywan, did you have a question? Yes, I have. Okay. Want to ask it? Um, about uh, what made you start your own business? I think she's asking what made you want to start your own business? It's like she's cutting in and out though. Yeah, I think we lost her. Uh, honestly, I mean, I think this particular idea just wouldn't get out of our heads. Um, so we we've just had a really a passion for um, 
our business that we launched and thought there was a white space for a, a happy retail brand that aggregated and celebrated these unique brands and then also um, kind of spoke to us through the imagery that there was really only super aspirational and then kind of or very fashion focused with nothing with no relatable content like you could see yourself in the products great thank you all right, well, thank you guys for being here. Have a great afternoon, evening, rather. Um, stay sane this week, because I feel like it's going to be a crazy one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, students, I'm just going to put up mm -hmm. your last final attendance question now. Um, hopefully, there we go. And I really look forward to hearing your answers. If someone handed you a bunch of seed money tomorrow, what would your business be? If anyone has any questions, let me know. Okay, so this is like a long essay question. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. It can be as long or as short as you want, but just interested to hear what your business ideas are. Okay, thank you, Professor. Bye. Bye. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Professor? Professor? Hi. Uh, how can I meet with you one by one today? I sent you a Zoom invite. Did you get it? Um, um, I can resend it. Thank you, Professor. Okay, no problem.
Thank you. 